Just to give you one example. Imam Nawawi anhu mentions a hadith in Sahih Muslim. It's a sound hadith in which a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, where are your parents? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. My father and your father is in hell. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. It's a sahih hadith. The Senate is sound. Now the ulama looking at that hadith, because it's a sound hadith, they differed on what it meant. And came to different conclusions. All of those scholars, and they are the minority, that felt that it meant that specifically the Prophet ﷺ was talking about his own parents, never ever spoke about that hadith in any other way except with the utmost adab. That was their opinion and they put their opinion. But the majority of ulama rejected those minority opinions and came to very clear conclusions. Now to go into why they did that would mean that I would have to go into a dars or a lesson about usul. Because there's people in this room, and you're not required to know this, but there's people who don't know the difference between ahad narrations and mutawatir narrations. They don't know the difference between multiply transmitted narration. They don't know the difference between solitary narration. They don't know the difference between dilala qat'iyya wa dilala dhaniya. They don't know what those things mean. Why? Because they didn't study the science. And why should you be expected if you go to a cardiologist to know when he says, well, unfortunately, the mitral valve has some problems. There's stenosis there. He's not going to say that. Because he's not going to assume you know what mitral valve means. And he's certainly not going to assume you know what stenosis means. He's going to say, well, he'll bring a little model, plastic model that some drug company gave him. And he'll show there's these two little valves. Most educated people know what a valve is. And the valve gets hardening. And unfortunately, because of that, it's having a difficult time opening and closing. So you're having fatigue. Well, there's certain things that we can do. And then he explained it. That's what a physician does. That's his job to explain to ignorant people what's wrong with them. And he doesn't assume they should know. He knows that people are busy. If you're a butcher, you're a butcher. Be a good butcher. Nobody likes to eat meat with a bunch of sharp bones broken up because if you get somebody who doesn't know how to cut the meat, he'll hack away at it and he'll break little bones and then you bite into it and the bone goes into your gum. That's a lousy butcher. Nobody likes to get a carpenter and then you have your whole kitchen done with new cabinets and you open the door and it falls off. You want somebody who knows how to put hinges on. Nobody likes their bread to be underbaked. Everybody wants those who do things in the world to do them well. Because if they don't, you suffer and I suffer the consequences of their poor labor. It's true or not true? In the same way, you certainly don't want a scholar who doesn't spend all of his time making sure that he gets right what he's teaching the people. Because this relates to your relationship with God. It doesn't relate to whether your bread is undercooked or whether the cabinet is well made or not. It's not even as dangerous as whether or not the surgeon really is as good as he says he is. Because this is about your soul. So, if you look at that hadith, the overwhelming majority of scholars said it certainly can't mean what the outward means. So what does it mean? Well, some of them say that you never take a verse of Qur'an which is all of the Qur'an is mutawatir. In other words, multiply transmitted. There's no debate about the Qur'an. But even the ulama differ about the dilala. So the, there's two types of qat'iyah. Qat'iyat al-wurud, which means that it comes without any doubt. And qat'iyat al-dilala, which is the meaning, there's no ambiguity. It's not mu'awwal, it's not muqayyid, it's not mujmal. There's different ways in which you interpret hadith. So the ulama say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُهِلِكَ الْقُرَىٰ حَتَّى يَبْعَذَ فِي أُمِّهَا رَسُولًا Allah doesn't destroy people until they send, He sends a messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنُّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We don't punish people until we send a messenger. Now the majority of ulama agree that the people of what's called fatra, which are the people that are between messengers, 
or people living in a time in which a message has been so corrupted it's no longer recognizable, they say that those people are not taken to account because they weren't given a sound message to either believe or disbelieve in it. And this is the opinion of our scholars. And that is why the ulama say that the people before the Prophet ﷺ came on the Arabian Peninsula are not people in the fire. And they interpret those hadiths. There are several hadiths which indicate that some of them were. And they interpret them. And some reject them altogether because ahad hadith are sometimes rejected. Abu Hanifa anhu rejected absolutely sound, 100% sound hadiths. He rejected them. Why? Because they were solitary narrations and they went against Quranic principles. And according to his usul, his methodology, you do not use a solitary narration to constrict a Quranic meaning. And he's a rightly guided Imam. So nobody can come and say, Abu Hanifa doesn't know what he's talking about. And this is our teaching. Now the other ulama disagree with him about that. Imam Madik takes uh, sound ahad and he will restrict the meaning of a verse based on that. But these are differences of opinion that are considered sound and rightly guided. And when the ulama say things, traditionally they might not mention that depending on the type of people. If they were talking only to Hanafis, who are common people, they're not going to go into what Imam Madik said or Imam Shafi'i, but in a mixed crowd where you have people that traditionally had Hanafi or Shafi'i fiqh, they would have to clarify these differences. Why? Because somebody said that Imam, he's saying something different from what I heard from my Shaykh. And then he'll start having either doubts in the Imam or doubts in his own Shaykh. And that's a problem. So it was binding on the teacher if it was a mixed crowd, if he gave a position of one Imam to clarify that that was only the position of that Imam. Which entails a great deal of study, of knowledge, of effort, but this is the way the traditional Muslim world lived and that is why they had a cohesion that does no longer exist because you have all of these people كُلُّ مَنْ حَبَّ وَدَبْ everybody that can walk on two legs speaking because they read a pamphlet and telling you what the position of Shaykh so-and-so or Shaykh so-and-so is without clarifying that it might be a minority opinion it might be even a deviant opinion so the ulama were very clear about this and Imam Siyuti wrote an entire booklet proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Prophet ﷺ, according to the majority of our ulama, that his parents were both Najiyani based on the ayah, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِبِنَا حَتَّى نَبْعَذَ رَسُولًا That's one proof. There are several other proofs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَقُومُ وَتَقَلُّبُكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ He sees you when you're up praying at night. He also saw you when you were moving through your ancestors. And he calls them Sajidina, People that were in a state of prostration. The Prophet ﷺ said that the people of Fitra, the people of Tawheed have always existed on the earth. Since the time of Adam until the end of time, there will always be people who understood that Allah was one. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah chose him from the best people on the earth. In other words, his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents were the best people on the earth. Now if they were mushrikun, and there were other muwahidun on the earth, he could not say that they were the best people. And the Prophet said, Ana Nabiyu la kithib, Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am a prophet and I'm not lying and I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. The Prophet would never boast of being the child of a mushrik. And this is the dominant opinion of our scholars. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, one of the greatest scholars in the history of Islam, considered authoritative in his opinions about the Qur'an, by consensus of the people of Sunnah, was asked once, what do you say about somebody who says the Prophet's parents are in the fire? And he said, Hadha mal'oon, this man is cursed. Mal'oon, mub'ad an rahmatillah. He said, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ لَعَنَهُمْ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Those who harm Allah and His Messenger, they are cursed in this world and the next. وَأَيُّ أَذَنْ أَعْظَمْ مِنْ أَنْ يَقُولْ لِأَحَدٍ أَبَوَاكَ فِي النَّارِ What greater harm would you do to a man to say your parents are in the hellfire? 
Because even out of adab, you don't say that to people. And the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, some of the ulama said, one, they reject the narration even though it's in the Sahih because it's ahad and it goes against a verse. Some of them say, no, we accept the method because there's two types of criticism. In the science of a hadith, there's criticism of the senad and there's criticism of the text. And so the senad can be absolutely sound and the text considered rejected. And in other cases, the senad could be unsound and the text considered sound. And this is well known in the ulama's tradition where they will say, سَنَدُهُ ضَعِيفٌ وَلَكِنْ مَعْنَاهُ صَحِيحٌ 